Well, good morning. There we are. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. It is uh, so good to see you. It's great to share worship with you and to be together in one place. And uh, we certainly feel, hope that you feel uh, welcomed and ready to worship today. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we do, uh, we do hope you feel welcomed. Uh, and we thank you for being here. It's certainly always a pleasure to uh, share worship with new folks. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Uh, I would invite all of you to uh, locate the registration pad that's in your pew. If you'd fill that out and pass it along, it's always very good to know that you're here. Um, and we say this each week, if there's anything you need from the pastors or the staff, just feel free to make a note on that. We'll be happy to uh, touch base with you as, as, we need, as you need us to. Um, so just if you would do that, that's very helpful. Um, a couple things that we'd like to announce before we get started. You'll see all of this in the bulletin. Uh, first, next, next week, next Sunday is a, is a big deal. So our kids are set to go back to school very soon. Uh, and next Sunday is our sort of back to school Sunday. Uh, if you, so if you have school-aged kids or friends with school-aged kids, uh, we invite them to be here for our back to school blessing of the backpacks. That's what we call it each year. Uh, it's always a good time to share with them and to send them to the end of their school year with love from their church family. Um, that afternoon, we'll be sharing in a church-wide pool party. And then there will be, uh, we'll, we'll begin our preparing for adolescence class that evening. So it's a big full day in our church family, and all of those details are in your bulletin, and I would invite you to take a look at that along with lots of other stuff that we have going on. As we ramp back up for the, um, for the semester, we're always, it's always a very busy time, so we hope that you'll take a few moments uh, to take a look and uh, join us as a bigger part of our church family. Uh, but as we begin, uh, we, we come, the, the activities are great, but we're here this morning to worship and to celebrate the gifts of God, uh, his love and grace and peace. So we do that by sharing the peace of Christ. So may the peace of Christ be with you. Would you please stand and greet one another in Christ's love? As we begin our worship time together, uh, I would ask that you join me uh, in a brief opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, for the blessings and hope that come with it. Help us understand the depth of your goodness this morning and the grace that we find in your presence and the unending nature of your love. So open us this morning to receive your spirit. Change us in the ways that we need changing and empower us to live lives as your people always. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. please be seated.
Good morning. We are glad that you have chosen to worship here today. Let us unite our voices in the call to worship. Sing a new song of gratitude and praise. Our God is God of all creation. Great is the Lord, and great is God's love. God's love calls us here. Let the heavens be glad. Let the mountains rejoice. Even the trees sing for joy, for God is God of all. As the people of God, let us affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
please join in the responsive reading of Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue, O oh, oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been an example to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together, saying, God has forsaken, pursue and seize him, for there is no deliverer. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste to kill. Before we spend time in prayer this morning, I would draw your attention to the prayer concerns that are listed in your bulletin. Um, as you look at those and hopefully pray for those this morning and throughout our week, I would make special mention today. Uh, you may have seen this from our church or in the news. Um, Dr. Artura East, Easton Williams, who was a United Methodist pastor and serve, was serving as a district superintendent in the Memphis area, uh, was murdered th earlier this week in Memphis. Um, so there's lots to pray for around that situation, for her family, uh, for those she was serving with, and for the churches in that area. So as we go to God in prayer, uh, may we spend time praying for that situation. I know you have um, situations in your own life that you might like to lift up to God. So may we spend just some time in prayer this morning uh, silently, and then I will uh, lead our pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, today we come to you thankful that you are with us. There is much joy around us, and, but we confess that we need you. There is trouble all around, in our hearts, our families, our community, the world. And try as we might, our force of will is not always enough to shape the world as we would have it, or as we understand you would have it. So we pray that you would teach us humility enough to rely on your grace. May we understand that our intentions don't always result in perfection. Our plans don't always result in the goodness that you've promised and that you have demonstrated. Above all, help us understand that our influence, our power to transforms, transform has limit without your presence in our lives. When you are a part of what we do, when we invite you into our lives, and when we seek to follow your perfect plan, then we are truly empowered to be a part of the transformation that you promise. So may it be so. When your grace becomes our reality, the reality of our lives changes. The love you share with us becomes the pattern of our life and all that separates begins to fade away. So God, as we pray for those in need and lift up those around us who are troubled, we pray that you would use us as examples of your love so that the world and those close to us may find the hope and the joy and the peace that you have so freely given to us. 
It is in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, and our Redeemer, and our example that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we invite our ushers to come forward for our time of tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Lord, in your name we give, and by the example of Christ we live. Bless these gifts and bless those who receive them, and we thank you that we are able to share, and we pray for the opportunity not just to do so, but to serve. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please remain standing as we sing. the 
glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. From the first chapter of Galatians, verses 3 through 5. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for our sins so he could deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To God be the glory forever and always. Amen. And from the 71st Psalm. My God, Rescue me from the power of the wicked. Rescue me from the grip of the wrongdoer and the oppressor, because you are my hope, Lord. You, Lord, are the one I've trusted since childhood. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Forever. And ever. Our Father. Our Father. Well, good morning, beloved. It's wonderful to see you in worship. Thank you for being here. Thank you to those who will join us online. We've been sharing the Lord's Prayer. And the point is, it's a framework for our lives. And we're to live it, not just say it, but live it. Uh, So with that in mind, uh, today we come to Deliver us from evil. So may we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, author and sustainer of life, O God who reigns from everlasting to everlasting. Be with us in our struggle with evil. Whether it's just the chaos of the world around us, or maybe the various ways that evil can visit us personally and cause harm and loss and grief. So come, Lord, speak to us the words of Jesus. Help us not just to say the Lord's Prayer, but to live it. And in that, find a way of trusting you in the face of evil. For this we hope and we pray as we pray that now the meditations of all our hearts, the words of my mouth, may they be acceptable in your sight, we pray. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Deliver us from evil. Rob mentioned Artura Eason Williams. She was a friend and a colleague. We were in our doctor of ministry program together, so we saw each other in recent years uh, in a classroom setting and fellowship with friendships in that group. But years ago, I was appointed to be the director of connectional ministries or conference ministries for the Memphis Conference at the time, and Artura was on my staff. So Monday, I received a text that reported early on that she had been murdered in her driveway and apparent carjacking, three juveniles. Worst part was her two youngest children of four teenagers were in the house. She was on the phone with her closest friend and the pastor who will preach her funeral. 
So there are those moments, those circumstances where we experience in a very personal way what I've come to call the eclipse of evil. Those moments and circumstances where evil seems to eclipse good and even God, the purposes of God, the goodness of God. That's the nature of evil. I was reminded this week of another phrase, and you may or may not remember this. It was an early, early school shooting on a mass scale in Dunblane, Scotland. It happened on March the 13th, 1996. And this came back to me this week thinking about Artura. The first press conference that was called, the gentleman who stepped to all of the mics waiting, the world was waiting for some response, some word, and he spoke to the mics and his first sentence came back to me this week. He said, evil has visited us this week and done blame. 16 children were killed and one teacher. Evil has visited us this week. I don't know about you, but I'm overwhelmed by how almost weekly evil visits us. It seems so chaotic in the world around us, our culture right now. We're like in this spiral of violence and evil visits. Uvalde, 19 children, Buffalo, 10 people, Highland Park, Chicago on the 4th of July, 7 people, and the list goes on and on. It, it happens every week. A week or so ago in Chattanooga, it's, it's everywhere. This downward spiral where somehow Evil has gotten hold of the minds and hearts of people. And so it is relevant that we pray, deliver us from evil, deliver us from evil. So we've been sharing the Lord's Prayer, and I've encouraged you to pray it three times a day like the early Christians did. I hope that you're doing that. I hope it comes to mind to maybe do that morning, midday, in the evening, the Lord's Prayer. And so I've been following Adam Hamilton's wonderful book, which I'll be sharing in August and September on Wednesday nights. And he makes the point, the Lord's Prayer is, yes, a prayer, but it's a framework for living. We're to put it into action So he reminds us that the primary thesis, the center of the prayer around which everything else gathers, the main petition is, Thy kingdom come, God. May thy kingdom come on earth now as it is in heaven eternally. That's the central thesis, the central petition. And everything else gathers around that. Everything else flows from that. Give us our daily bread. The essentials that we need. May we learn to trust that you will provide for that. You will provide enough. And that will give us peace of mind and heart. Give us the essentials, Lord. Because we pray thy kingdom come to earth right now as we need it. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our debts, the ways that we have dishonored you and harmed others. Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive others, as we imitate and reflect your character. We pray for that. We need to put that into action. And now this phrase, these phrases, lead us, Lord, Do not leave us to our own devices. Lead us. We need your guidance. We need your leadership, Lord. 
lead us not into temptation or error or times of trial left in and of ourselves, our own devices. Lead us, Lord, but instead, it all fits together. Lead us, Lord, not into the bad stuff or where we can self-destruct, but lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. And then it names it evil. Evil is one of these huge subjects. There's no way I can begin to address it. There have been libraries written about it by people so much smarter than I am. So I just want to give you a few guideposts this morning, mainly from the wisdom of Adam Hamilton. But we pray this prayer. The fancy theological word is theodicy, the problem of evil. And it goes like this, if God is a good God, if God is a sovereign God, if we, through our faith, are going to say, God has a plan, then what do we do with evil? I've grown to kind of distrust people who say God has a plan, not that God doesn't have an ultimate plan, but that's not to be some flippant phrase. When you stand at the casket of your infant child, don't tell me God has a plan. When you see people gunned down in their driveway by three juveniles and you say, oh, it's all in God's plan, Yes, God is sovereign, and God has an ultimate plan, but we struggle with evil right now. When you see the carnage perpetrated by one person in the Ukraine, then we pray, we cry out to God, God, we need to see some evidence of the plan. We need to see your sovereignty. And I guess in God's good time it comes. So theodicy, the, pro the problem of evil is the human predicament. If God is good, if God is in charge, why do we suffer? Why does violence take place? Why are there injustices that are not addressed? So the classic response of Christian theology and the Bible is... We live in a fallen world. That's our human predicament. And it's not just a nice little children's story in Genesis that we teach our children about Adam and Eve eating an apple and falling into sin. It's not a children's story. It is the core of our reality that we live in a fallen world. And that we have fallen out of rebellion from God. We bear responsibility. And God created us in His own image with the capacity for healthy, wholesome relationship with God and others. And we rebelled. It is in our nature. We destroyed the image of God in us. We destroyed our capacity to love one another properly. And so we participate in that fallenness. And we reap what we sow. So that means not only is there evil in the world, there is evil within us. And we can be harmful and destructive. And so we need help. We need redemption. We need transformation and salvation. That's the point. And so in the face of evil, whether it's on a large scale or when it comes home, close to home, or it's within us, we cry out to God. We pray to God, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us, Lord. Do not lead us, 
leave us to our own devices because we will self-destruct and hurt others. Lead us, Lord, and deliver us. That's why we pray it. So it's relevant, it's real in our lives. We see it all around us and within us. You know, I have to confess that, well, theodicy, the problem of evil, after World War I and II, and particularly the Holocaust, theologians had to go back and rethink all of this. The 20th century was supposed to be the Christian century where Christianity spread across the world and the kingdom of God would come to earth through education and health care and all of these good things that can and should happen. But it could not change the human propensity to harm. And so World War I happens, World War II happens, the Holocaust happens. And particularly the Jews question, God, where are you? Elie Fussell has a small little novel called Night. And it's from the perspective of those who were in the concentration camps. And they're lined up for another execution. There were teenagers being hung that morning. And here are Jews lined up to witness it, to be terrorized by it in the concentration camp. They're hanging teenagers. And someone, all Jewish people say, where is God? They were saying, where is God? Why doesn't God do something about this? And one of the people in the line watching this execution says, God is up there. God's up there, being hung, being executed. Eli Fussell. The problem of evil. The irony of that is, that's what we see. Jesus enters into this evil world and is executed by the evil to save us. So it's the problem of evil. So I have to admit that post 9-11, I remember it so vividly on the night of 9-11, we had a, a vigil for our community. And I was to speak to the whole community. And I said, what do I say? In the face of such evil, obviously, it struck us all as bigger than people, bigger than humanity. It was cosmic evil. I thought Vanderbilt Divinity School had drummed out of me the belief in the largeness of evil, the cosmic evil. But that night, I had to name the evil. Evil has visited us today. In the Old Testament, there's a phrase that says, evil came near. In our psalm that we heard earlier, our scripture readings, it talks about delivering us, Jesus delivers us from this evil age The biblical worldview is one where evil is cosmic. There's a cosmic struggle between good and evil. And so one of the takeaways to that is that I had to reevaluate. I talked about grace and goodness all the time, as I do. But in the world in which we live, you cannot dismiss that God has opposition. That Satan is the one who opposes God And just as we hope to be possessed by goodness, we can also be possessed by evil. I used to kind of make fun of all those horror movies, you know, the spinning heads and the exorcisms and all that. But let me tell you something. Watch the news. Daily. We are living in the midst of the cosmic reach of evil that takes possession of people. Just as you can be possessed by goodness, evil can inhabit a human being. Dallas Willard is 
a very wise teacher taught at USC, and he says, I've shared this with you, he says the mind is the stronghold of evil. All of these shooters, all of this violence that we see in our country, all of the violence that we see around the world, the harm that can be done, it starts as an idea in someone's head. So guard your mind and your heart. One of the parallels with these younger shooters is that they all have played those video games. There is a wealth of video games that are shooter games. They've all played them. You know that the video games where you shoot the assault rifles are so realistic and teach you the instincts of using those assault rifle rifles so well that our military has come to use videos to teach people the instincts of how to use those weapons. You set a kid in front of a television playing those video games for years as entertainment. And we now see that we are reaping the consequences of that because that child's mind became inhabited with violence. We see it over and over again. You name the shooters, and if they're young, that's a commonality. Evil starts in the mind, and it can inhabit a person. So we pray. Here's the Lord's Prayer. Two petitions. Lead us, Lord. Lead us not into temptation or testing or a time of trial where we are left to our own devices, our own self-destructiveness. God, you've got to lead us. We need to be praying that every day. Lord, we need your leadership, your guidance. Do not leave us to ourselves. So Adam Hamilton says so beautifully, he says the emphasis is on lead us, Lord, lead us, Lord. Pray it every day, lead us, Lord. It is God's intention to lead us. He says God places before us the right path, the right track, the right way to live in relationship with God and others. And so we want God to lead us because when we lead, we get off track. When we are leading, our ego is leading, our selfishness is leading, we miss the mark. That's the story of humanity. It's the Bible from cover to cover. We miss the mark. That's the definition of sin. We fracture our relationship. Lead us, Lord. Do not leave us to our own devices. Lead us to do the opposite of our will and to accomplish your will. Inhabit us so that evil does not find a home in us. That's what we're praying. We need to be led. Adam Hamilton again says so beautifully, God is not in the business of misleading. If you open yourself up to God in prayer and petition and say, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. And then you say, lead me, Lord. You are opening your heart and mind and life to God's leadership. The kingdom will come. God will rule you with God's gracious love and transform you by His Spirit. But you have to ask for God to lead you. Because otherwise... It is your will, it is your ego that is leading. And that doesn't end well. It ends in, in sin and destructiveness and the inhabitation of evil that will harm. And that has eternal consequences. So the first petition is, lead us, Lord. Don't leave us to our own devices. And then the second one is, deliver us. 
Lord, we feel overwhelmed by the cosmic evil that is visiting us in a very personal way. So that word deliver means rush to my help. Rush to our help, Lord. Where we see division and hatred and enmity, the Bible says, rush to our help. Where we see minds being twisted by a violent or hateful inclination, rush to our help. Where we see the world spiraling and becoming so much more unpredictable and unstable, rush to our help, is chaos. Where we are um, tempted to cocoon in our own little personal place of safety and comfort, just for me and my selfishness, and it's all about me, rush to our aid, deliver us. Where I am losing my capacity for mercy and empathy and compassion, and my heart is being hardened by the hardness of the world, rush, rush to my help, Lord. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. So the petitions are, lead us, Lord, lead me, Lord, not into a time of trial, not where I'm overcome by evil, but deliver us, deliver me. Come rush to my help. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to cope very well. So that's the prayer. That's the prayer. And so it's a prayer for God to guide you and inhabit you. Or else we are lost. And that's what we're seeing. Lostness that has painful, tragic consequences. I mentioned this name, Chuck Colson. I talked about Dallas Willard saying, the, the mind is the stronghold of evil. Evil starts with an idea, and it gets hold of your ego and can drive you to live destructively. Chuck Colson was Richard Nixon's strategy guy, an aide to the president. He was the hatchet man. He was the strategist behind Watergate. And there were other co-conspirators, but Colson writes later the old phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And Colson says, that's exactly what happened to me. He said, I was a Christian in name only, but when you get that power, and it's absolute power, and it corrupts you, then you do corrupt things. It can inhabit you. So Chuck Colson has written some incredible books about Christian ethics, ironically. And so he says prison was the best thing that ever happened to him. It is not until you've been humiliated and broken, and it's just you and God in your brokenness that God can really get hold of you. And so prison really turned him around. And you, you're kind of suspicious of Chuck Colson, the Christian, but I mean, it's, it was an authentic conversion because of what he does later. He was in prison, and he started, as he gets out, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? He started Prison Fellowship, the International Prison Fellowship. It's an incredible organization. So he began to visit all of these prisons all around the world, and the worst prisons on earth. In Russia, all over the world. But he says the, the worst prison he ever visited was in Peru. So they take him into this prison, small confined rooms, no standards of human care or decency, thousands and thousands of prisoners. 
And so they brought him there to show him cell block C. The prisoners called it the Christian boot camp. Cell block C was where the Christian community in the worst prison in the world gathered. They were there every day. And they would have worship and Bible study and counseling. And they would lead people to Christ. And so Chuck Colson goes into this, the worst cell block in a prison in the world. And all he heard about were how people were saved by Jesus Christ. But not only that, transformed. And he says story after story of the story the inmates would tell the power of evil in my life was broken. The chains of evil were broken, and I have been transformed. And so that's what has to happen, is the power of evil has to be broken. We're dealing with a cosmic evil that can inhabit people. So it made me think, as we pray, lead us, Lord, and deliver us. How do we live this? Well, you align with Jesus Christ. You make sure you're in alignment with Christ. You immerse yourself in Jesus Christ. You read the Word and His teaching, Jesus Christ, and you honor your baptism. Whether you're 10 years old or 110, if you came to baptism, you would answer the question, Will you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I used to just dismiss those first two. I understand repentance, repent of your sin. For years, as a pastor, I said, why are we asking these 8, 10, 12, 13-year-olds to renounce the evil and reject the evil powers of this world, seriously, that seemed a little over the top. Now I understand the wisdom of the ages of Christianity. Evil has the capacity to inhabit us just as much as God does. It's a matter of who you pay attention to and who you open your heart and mind and soul to. So, our vows of baptism and allegiance to Christ and faith are about loyalty to Christ and being delivered from this evil age so that we participate in the reign, the rule, of God's sovereign grace. Because sooner or later, evil visits us all. So who are you going to cooperate with? Who and what are you going to allow to inhabit your mind, your heart, your soul, your life? Let's pray this every day. Lead us, Lord. Don't leave us to our own devices. And deliver us from evil. Let's pray that and let's live it. Well, as we close today, we'll sing the old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's live it. Let's stand as we sing. Leaning on the edge.
Again, thank you for being in worship. Let's go out of here to live the Lord's Prayer. Receive this blessing. Go forth now as people of God in Christ, empowered by His Spirit, His character to participate in God's kingdom come to earth. May the gracious, generous love of Christ inhabit you as we reject evil push it away, and live under the reign of Christ as Lord in our life. So go in peace, go with the grace of God, and share the grace and peace of Christ with others. Amen.